All right, we can be seated. Okay, we're standing up in the jury, so when the jury comes in throughout this whole trial, as soon as you get here, if you want to sit down, feel free. Okay. <coughs> okay. Um, uh, before we actually start, Ms. Noack, uh, you have an issue tomorrow afternoon. Uh, if we stop at 3 tomorrow, will that work for you? Will you give you enough time? Okay. So the parties can just plan on stopping at 3 tomorrow. We'll probably make up for it on Friday, stay a little bit longer on Friday afternoon. All right. With that, I have a few more instructions to read the jury. Before we begin the trial, I would like to tell you about the procedures we will be following. I want to describe how the trial will be conducted and explain what we're going to be doing. The first step of the trial will be opening statements. Either attorney may make an opening statement if they choose to do so. The defendant's attorney may reserve opening statement until later in the trial or may elect not to make an opening statement at all. Opening statements are not evidence. Their purpose is only to help you understand what the evidence will be. Next, the prosecution will offer evidence. Evidence consists of the sworn testimony of the witnesses, the exhibits received in evidence, and the stipulated, admitted, or judicially noticed facts. After the prosecution's evidence, the defendant may present evidence on his own behalf that he is not required to do so. I want to remind you that the defendant is presumed to be innocent. The prosecution must prove the guilt of the defendant beyond a reasonable doubt. The defendant does not have to prove his innocence or call any witnesses or introduce any evidence. You may have to decide what evidence to believe. You should carefully consider all the testimony given and the circumstances under which each witness has testified. Consider each witness's knowledge, motive, state of mind, demeanor, and manner while on the stand. Consider the witness's means of knowledge, ability to observe, and strength of memory. Consider also any relationship each witness may have to either side of the case, the manner in which each witness might be affected by the verdict, and the extent to which, if at all, each witness is either supported or contradicted by evidence in the case. You should consider all the facts and circumstances shown by the evidence which affects the credibility of a witness's testimony. You may believe all of the testimony of a witness or part of it or none of it. At the conclusion of the evidence, I will tell you the rules of law which you are to use in reaching your verdict. I will read those rules of law to you and you will be allowed to take them with you into the jury room during your deliberations. After you've heard all the evidence and instructions, the prosecution and defense may make their closing arguments. Like opening statements, closing arguments are not evidence. The prosecuting attorney will have the opportunity to reply to the closing argument made by the defense. You will then go to the jury room to deliberate on a verdict. Your purpose as jurors is to decide what the facts are, and your decision must be based solely upon the evidence and the law that I give you in my instructions. At times during the trial, the lawyers may make objections. This simply means the lawyer is requesting that I make a decision on a particular rule of law. It is the duty of a lawyer to object to evidence which he believes may not be proper, properly offered. Do not draw any conclusions from the objections or from my rulings on the objections. If I sustain an objection to a question, the witness may not answer it. If I overrule an objection, it means I have decided to point against the attorney who has made the objection. As jurors, you must draw no inference from the question or speculate as to what the witness would have said if permitted to answer. At other times, I may instruct you not to consider a particular statement that was made. You must not consider any evidence to which an objection has been abstained, obtained, sustained, excuse me, or which I have instructed you to disregard. Such evidence is to be treated as if you would never seen nor heard it. It is my job to decide what rules of law apply to the case. You must follow all of the rules as I explain them to you. You may not follow some and ignore others. Even if you disagree or do not understand the reasons for some of the rules, you must follow them. You will then apply these rules to the facts which you have determined from the evidence. In this way, you will determine whether the prosecution has proven the guilt of the defendant beyond a reasonable doubt. During the trial, I may need to talk to lawyers out of your hearing about questions of law. Sometimes you may be asked to leave the courtroom while I discuss such matters with the lawyers. We will try to limit these interruptions as much as possible. 
do not infer from any ruling or from anything I say during the trial that I hold any views either for or against either party to this case. Rules governing jury trials do not allow jurors to ask questions directly of a witness. However, if you do have a question you would like a witness to be asked during the trial, write your question down. You don't need to sign it. Just hand the question down and it'll work its way down to Cindy. Um, one of the things that happens in my courtroom a lot is I tend to uh, get all hyped up and go too fast and I'll forget to look over and see if there's questions. So if you have a question and it looks like we're just moving on, raise your hand, get our attention, because once that witness leaves, they may not be able to come back to answer your question. Once we get the question in written form from Cindy, uh, I'll talk about it with the lawyers. If I decide the pro question is proper, it will be asked at an appropriate time. Keep in mind, however, that the rules of evidence or other rules of law may pre prevent some questions from being asked. I will apply the same legal standards to your questions as I do the questions asked by the lawyers. If a particular question is not asked, do not guess why or what the answer might have been. The failure to ask the question is not a reflection on the person asking the question, and you should not attach any significance to the failure to ask the question posed by a juror. Once you begin your deliberations, if you have a question about the evidence in the case or the instructions or the brief forms that have been given, uh, your foreperson should write that question on a piece of paper. Uh, the foreperson should sign it, give it to the bailiff, or bring it to me. I will then confer with the attorneys as the appropriate way to answer your question. Again, there may be some questions that under the law I'm not permitted to answer. It's improper for me to answer that question, I will tell you. Uh, please do not try and guess what the answer to your question might be or why I'm not able to answer a particular question. To help you understand the trial, you've been provided with notebooks which contain some information about this case. Please write your name in these notebooks. They can only be used in the courtroom and the jury room. You can take the notebooks back and forth between the courtroom and jury room, uh, but you can't take them anywhere else. Uh, if, if you're going to have additional notebooks in terms of um, exhibits, which after exhibits are admitted, uh, those copies of those exhibits, at least the exhibits that you can make copies of, will be placed in your notebook during recesses. What's in your notebook, if you want to take notes on them or, or whatever, you're free to do that. The original exhibits uh, need to remain pristine and you won't get those till the end of the trial, but the original exhibits will go back with you into the jury room. The original exhibits you don't want to write on, but anything you have in your notebooks, you're, you're free to do whatever you want with. You can use your notebooks, uh, the ones you have in front of you now, to use uh, take notes during the trial. Uh, you're not required to do so. If you do take notes, you should not allow note taking to detract from your close attention to the testimony and conduct of each witness and all other evidence received during the trial. Take notes sparingly. Do not try and summarize all testimony. For example, notes can be particularly helpful when dealing with measurements, times, distances, identities, and relationships. Whether you take notes or not, you should rely on your memory as much as possible and not upon your notes or the notes of other jurors. Any notes you take are to refresh your own individual memory. No one else will read your notes. At the end of the case, the notes will be returned to the court and destroyed. Most of the exhibits in this case are going to be displayed on that TV screen up there, and that's why we were having problems. Uh, you didn't start right on time. We uh, Worked on this uh, last week and, and some over the weekend, and then it didn't work when it was time for the TV to come on. So we'll see what happens once the attorneys get going. Uh, as I've said, you will also receive notebooks which will contain, um, which, in which we will put uh, the exhibits. They're also, also going to contain a blank exhibit list. It is a good idea, or it might be a good idea, if you want to keep track of the exhibits by number. Um, you can do that as the exhibits are admitted or as they come in and then you can write a brief description of what it is. Uh, you don't have to do that if you don't want to, but with the large uh, number of exhibits that we expect to be admitted in this case, it'd be a good way for you to keep track of what's, what's in your notebooks and how to find them. Those exhibit notebooks, uh, once the trial is over, uh, will also be returned uh, to the court and with those along with your notes. So uh, nobody else will see whatever notes you put on, on your own individual exhibit that we give you. With that, it's time for opening statements. The prosecution gets to go first. And I believe you're up, Mr. Johnson. Thank you, Your Honor. This is 13-year-old Bill Redline. On November 18, 
2012. Earlier in the morning, the same day, that you can take his trip and find a Durango he can follow. The trip he would never return, return from. The last day, no going to fight. Hanging out with his friends, having fun, uninjured, and healthy feet by all attempts. On November 18th of 2012, Elaine Paul, Dylan's mother, brought him to the airport. It had been decided in the custody case that he was going to travel to Durango to see his father to the Thanksgiving holiday. Because of his young age, Elaine Paul was able to take Dylan close to the community. And as he walked in there, he said to him, Are you too old to give your mother a hug? And Dylan turned around and walked back and embraced his mother. And they said goodbye. And Dylan walked onto that airplane. The fly to Durango. And Elaine Paul would never see the son Dylan allowed. They continued to communicate. As Dylan took the airplane to Denver, took over by the Durango, <clears throat> they talked by text messages. I'm on a plane to Durango. Oh, good, you did well, son. Proud of you. Love you. Thanks for keeping in touch so well. You landed in Durango, son? Just did. Your dad gets you, son? Yes. Brown face. This text message with the brown face about his father picking him up is the last invitation that a land red line could ever receive from the Chunga. Dylan Redwine did not want to go on that trip. He had stopped speaking to his father weeks ago by text and call. He told all of his friends that he didn't want to go. He told his family members that he didn't want to go on the trip. He got to the point where Elaine Hall had to ask for attorney in the custody case, Amber Harrison, to be way to go on the session. Ms. Harrison told her the court order and she held her to that. She still in Redmond got on that airplane. He flew to Durango and his father picked him up. He still in Redmond was standoffish from the start. You can see it on video at the airport. You can see it at their first stop at Walmart, nearly 45 minutes in Walmart, very little contact and suspect out to be called the easy one to see the Walking into the Walmart. See the intensity of separation. I'll show you the whole video inside the store. Following the trip to Walmart, Dylan declined a sit down meeting with his father, <coughs> sit down dinner with his father, and they did McDonald's drive. That very night, Dylan Redwine was communicating with his friend Ryan Nava, asking if he could speak over his friend's house instead of his father's house. But his father told him no. And so after McDonald's, they headed north, up towards Lake Five Up past the top of the lake to a dead end road, County Road 500, where the defendants were. An area where many of the people who lived there, or vacationed there, or directly lived there, and left them, relatively secluded area to the defendant home. No one would ever see Dylan Redline again alive after that. No one would ever hear from Dylan Redwine, alive again after the accident. By 9.56 p.m., a young child who, like many young boys, was attached to his electronics, to his iPod, to his iPhone, cell phone. After 9.56, that is in all communications and Dylan's devices, even roaming activities. And that night, in that secluded home, he sat under the shadow of Middle Mountain. The defendant murdered Dylan Redwine. And despite having to cover a knife to conceal his crime, 
And despite having nearly 18 hours since the last communication until anyone was notified that they were missing, and despite having 10 days before a missing child search in the search warrant for his home, despite all those opportunities to cover up this crime, evidence of that crime will come to light here in this court. Is Dylan's blood found in his living room? Is the odor of human remains on his clothing, in his truck, and in his home? With opportunities, all electronic keeping that evening, along with the defendant. With motive, a damaged relationship exposed in compromising photographs. Photographs in the hands of a 13-year-old who was disgusted by it that triggered a violent rage with the defendant. The Dylan's remains located only 18.6 miles up the dirt road to Eagle Mountain in the defendant's home in an area he was familiar with on an ATV trail like he owned less than 100 yards from the road. With Dylan's skull located much farther up that same road, more than a five mile drive over a mountaintop to another part of the road, where it was located three years after his disappearance, a tiny microscopic knife mark and fractures consistent with blunt force trauma. The defendant sits here today to stand trial for that murder. On November 19th of 2012, Dylan Redwine's friend Brian Nava was expecting him. He had communicated with him the night before by texting him. Dylan had wanted to spend the night there rather than with his father. But they had settled on 6.30 a.m. Dylan was supposed to arrive at his home. And they text about it. And those texts from the night before were covered by law enforcement and the two men who got into the case. Did your dad say no? Yeah. Oh, okay. Can I come over early at 6 30 early tomorrow? That's still on my lap. You better let me in. I will. You can get my grandma. I'll call your ass all day if you don't. But Dylan didn't call. And Dylan didn't arrive. And all day long on November 19th, Brian Nava never heard from Dylan Redmond. And by 6.46 in the morning, Brian Nava was texting Dylan, where are you? And by 7.30 in the morning, Brian Nava was calling him. No answer. No communications all day long. Not from his cell phone that he had made his hands on. Not from his iPod that he had last texted with Brian Nava. Not from the landline at the house. Not from his computer. Not from his Facebook. Nothing. It wouldn't be until later that day, around 4.50, I'm sorry, after 4 p.m., that the defendant would swing by the market house, the market office in the state. And he would come in and say to the marshal, Marshal Abdella, that he didn't testify to you. Have you seen my son? It was an odd question. It was at, after 4 o'clock in November, and he was getting close to dusk. He didn't seem alarmed at all. Marshal Abdella didn't know him, didn't know his son. The question really didn't make a lot of sense to him. He hadn't brought any pictures of him on the show. He could find an attempt to locate who he comes out. He didn't even really ask the marshal. But the marshal would tell him he would text or call his mom if he was very strong. He would defend him and ask my brother to be contacted with him all. And of course, the long haul called the police, called the sheriff's office. From there, search and rescue would find him in the And from there, he would find him deep in the And on November 19th, after 4 p.m., Search and rescue dispatch out to the defendant's home. And they were concerned because it was November, because it gets dark early, because the child was missing in a remote mountain area 
and they wanted to get started looking for them. So they contacted the defendant and they asked him for information and asked him to help them. They told them his fishing was told him. Maybe he might fish. He told them all of his belongings were gone. Dylan had arrived with a backpack. He had arrived with extra clothing. He had arrived with a cell phone. He had arrived with a baseball hat. He had arrived with no coat. The search and rescue had dogs, and they wanted to search for fence patterns. How close they were to the dog dog. He wanted to be. But the defendant said he did not have any of those rules. So they pointed to a pillow case for the defendant was going to go and cut that. And they asked for it. And they started trying to search with the pillow case, but they couldn't get any kind of sale dog. And so that night, search and rescue set up a cross to mark red line. And they searched the woods. And they knocked on doors. And they looked everywhere, nervous that this child without a coat might be in the way. They searched Lord Ewan, who will testify here, he was in charge of that police operation. So will tell you that they searched into the night well past the night and turned 15 to 1 and see that search time and time ago. So at the time, we thought 9 o'clock. But at 11 o'clock, yeah. As Roy Breeland sat looking at that house, as he'll tell you, the defendant had been business with this and not involved in much in problems. Had not been frantic like every other parent who'd ever seen in this contest for years on the trip. As he stood set up out there still looking for Dylan and those woods, he watched as that light went out. And in that house went dark at 11 p.m. At a time when most people would have been out in the woods with a flashlight if there was a dog or a child. At a time when most people would know to leave the light on in case the child was walking, to find their way home. At 11 p.m., the defendant house went dark. Young John. The initial search for Dylan continued over the next several days. There were neighborhood campuses. There were searches in the woods. Police were involved. They checked on local sex offenders. They downloaded cell phone towers. They did interviews. They checked everywhere they could. There were some sightings of Dylan that were run down and amounted to much. There were sightings out of state for Dylan that amounted to much. But over the course of the next 10 days, as they continued to look for Dylan, you get every no one heard and no one saw him. You'll hear that over the course of that 10 days, which led to the first one of the defendant's home, that over the course of that 10 days, the defendant was asked twice. And you'll hear that he was given and provided a form, a written statement from the FBI, that all the information on the form he might have on the He was talked to several times, leading up to the point that the time was set up. And over the course of that 10 days, you want written statement. The defendant said, very simple, reasonable thing, very little detail, but mentioned no injuries, no injuries, nothing like that. The general timeline was as follows. He had picked Dylan up at the airport around 5.50. He was down to Walmart. He went to the McDonald's drive through and he drove up to 5 feet. When they arrived at the house, the defendant said Dylan was on his bike. He was on his computer on the couch. But they watched the movie. He added in a random detail that was a little more descriptive about a nurse football that they were talking to now and having some fun. And then he said around 9.30 or 10 o'clock he went to that. Right around the time you'll see again in the future. The next morning, he woke up around 5.30 or 5.45. He knew Dylan wanted to go to his friend's house. He stirred around in the house at 7.30 to claim that Dylan had been out. But despite not seeing the sun in a couple of months, he decided to go to town and he was going to run his friend. And he drove in on a payroll issue. And he drove in a few of the attorney. And then he drove back home. And along the way, he was here and placed a couple of calls into the old phone. And then he arrived back home around 1130 to go into town. There was no sign of there was none of Dylan's items 
So the sun is tipping. And it wouldn't be until about 3 o'clock that he would leave the house and drive around to a couple of women's certain houses and then swing by the good And that's when the rain hall would get back. And that's when the rain hall would call the police. And that's when the missing person investigation was back. But there are issues with this thing. There were family members talked to and things that didn't find out. At 2 a.m., the night of the 18th, the night that Dylan last communicated, a neighbor is seeing the light on his two And then off again in the morning, before daylight, the chief stated to the house. The telescope didn't yield any kind of fact to Dylan. The attendant continued to talk about the issue. So when talking to his brother, he wouldn't walk off miles to the reservoir when they would need to be invited to the house. He wasn't even someone who would put the hero kitchen by himself. And then there were the photographs. The photographs that you can consider is one purpose, one purpose. Very important, very important motive. The photographs that investigators learned Dylan has been aware of is Dylan has found on the defendant's computer with his brother. That in a previous argument, Dylan, two months earlier, along with his father, had texted his brother Corey and said, Send me the piece pic of Dad. I want to show him who he really is. Pictures in the hands of a 13 year old of the defendant. Wearing women's underwear, doing things he does with us. Photographs that after Dylan's remains were found, when two of the Lane Hall friends drove by his house and called him a killer from Lane Hall. But he came out of his house and argued. And it wasn't until they called him a shitty that a book came over his face that he grabbed the lock and picked it up over his head and came towards their car, fearing him for his head. By November 29th, in the search warrant, investigators had figured out. Because they pulled up in the morning, and they had police cars, and they had the Colorado Bureau of Investigation with them, and they had the Federal Bureau of Investigation with them. And they were going to search that home because the committee wanted to see from and wanted to see them. And the things weren't added up, and they were granted that search warrant. They contacted the police. They all didn't But they told him this time under the threat of finding it anyway. We are going to bring in scientific methods and light to search this home. You will find blood. There's blood there. Is there any reason we're going to find the one's blood in your house? And that's when the defendant's story changed. And that's where the defendant described when we were playing that nerd football. I think you might have had a little sore on you. Sore that no one could have seen you for this. It may be one of those nerd football skills in that tiny living room that touches next to you. It's just a hand. And at one point, Dylan had spit on the floor of the house. Maybe you could be back with a letter with this question. That's what <clears throat> Defendant's living room. You'll get to see the living room in trial. We're going to reconstruct it. You can see just how tall it is. You get to see the nerd football. In fact, this is that way. The blood in the living room wasn't visible to you to die. But when crime scene investigator Bill Clayton, he's done over a thousand crime scenes. He worked decades as a crime scene investigator. Came into this house because it wasn't visible to me that I didn't need to be the whole one. When he went into that living room, he used a chemical process called Lumon, a spray that makes blood well in the dark and you turn the light on. And it illuminates and fades out. And when Joe Clayton came in and processed that living room, he very different picture. 
on the corner of the coffee table. What? On a love seat in the pocket. Cushion. Reaction to balloon and all. Consisting of blood. At the base of that same love seat. Street. Pocket. Reaction of blood. And on the floor, under the area rug, which was free of any blood itself, reaction of the consistent with blood. Thank you. In that living room, on this corner of the coffee table, and on this love seat, and under this corner, of the rug. Blood. CSI Joe Clayton did further testing. He used a chemical called phenocaline that verified that in fact it was blood. There are some false positives you can get from the luminol as well here. Phenocaline confirmed that it's in fact blood that the luminol reacts. He used a test called chemistry to verify that it was in fact blood. And then he blood. He went over those areas. Hoping to be able to get enough of that blood that wasn't supposed to make it out, but that is <laughs> And those swabs were sent off to the Colorado Bureau of Investigation Lab, and there they were tested for serology. And those three locations I just indicated to you confirmed the blood by the serology that was sent. Then they were tested for DNA, and they were tested for DNA at those serology. Back in 2012, they were retired. The biggest technology is when investigators learn that they don't have to use the next one, but they will explain that that Dylan was a their strong support, numbers far beyond the millions, strong support. Dylan Redwine being a contributor and a mixture of himself and Corey Redwine, this portion under here. Corey Redwine will come in here and testify and tell you he never bled in that living room. We could have had some skin cells or other skin. Dylan could not be excluded from this blood. Could not be excluded from this blood, which was a, a mixture between himself and Father and the DNA. And the blood on the lust is a single source DNA profile. A match Dylan Redwine and Dylan Redwine only. Dylan Redwine, who had arrived on this trip uninjured. Dylan Redwine, who's been missing now for 10 days. Dylan Redwine, no one has heard from. Not even a text since that night in November 18th. Dylan Redwine was excluded missing. His blood was missing. Still, investigators had not found Dylan Redwine's body. This search was only 10 days after Dylan had gone missing. There was a heavy focus of searches on areas that they could search in the winter, and specifically the lake, and specifically bodies of water, depending on the type of that fish. And so they dredged the Cuyacito over and over, continued to work with Mr. Dylan, and they continued to run down tips, and they continued to do interviews and still. Those times don't arrive anywhere. Middle Mountain Road, across from the defendant's house, uh, the road is dead. He thought it was dead end. But it stood above his home. He could drive around it and then to the back side of it. This front side of Middle Mountain Road is a gate. And the gate closes on November 30th every year, how does it get a pass? It closes not so investigators couldn't mount up to big church, so a lot of that is on now get the whole area search the all the whole area to access. But come June, Dylan still had not been found. Volunteers from throughout the community, law enforcement, they all got together they were gonna do the big search on the old mountain road Dylan's family. Colorado Springs traveled down for the search. 
his mother, his brother, that father came and he put down in there. And as everyone was coming together to do this search, and everyone was coming down from Colorado Springs to defend them by now. He went out on the road on a work training as a big search hand out flyers to the lower building cities. When this search started on June twenty second, twenty twelve, people gathered, trailheads, and they searched. They pulled the road. They got down on hands and knees. They spread out and covered every inch with one And on that big search in June of twenty thirteen, everyone's first year was Still in red wine the names we found inside and going out there. After all, after all the speculation about them running away, after all the speculation about them fishing, after all the theories of an animal maybe saving my body, after all of this, in the end, in the end, we found six miles of dirt and tall. Less than a hundred yards from the trailhead. And to show you on the map, I'm sure some of you are familiar with the topography map. This is a mile and a half of the crow flies. A grueling cliff to dead fall hill. Nothing anyone has walked. And the rest of you talk about that. Not, not something anyone would, would consider walking. But 8.6 miles up the road, the dead end dirt road that goes to the season, less than 100 yards away. On an ATV trail, you'll hear the defendant on an ATV in the area well. with yellow arrows bracketing the trail. There's a second one right here that you can't quite see in the gap. Yellow arrows bracketing the trail. So as vehicles come around the curve in the dirt road, designed to catch headlights, to show them what the turn. One of the most visible areas on the mountain at night to show them the trail. Just down that trail, Show you how accessible it was, even at night. Mm -hmm. Several yards down that hillside, they only fall into the down Slightly downhill grade, three of instructions, identifiable in the night, a trail known to people in the area. Perfect place for someone who needs to get with the body in the night. Enough of Dylan's remains are found to show that he, he was dead. And you'll hear from the experts in the case that enough bones were found to show that this the primary remain site. It wasn't a single bone carry or anything like that. In fact, you'll hear in the case that nearly all of them bones but one found in the square mile radius. 
but two femurs, tibia, scapula, and clavicle down there. As for other bones, there were a couple of fillers as well that were noted down there. Investigators had combed the hip side so thoroughly that they found many of the fillers went to the hip and higher up that. They combed so closely they found shooter tracks. They found shirt tracks. But what was perhaps more telling, perhaps more interesting than what they actually did at the community site, was what they didn't find. No cell phone, no wallet, no backpack, no ball pack, not a single identifying document. And Bill and Red One. They found a shoe, a sock, and clothing straps. I don't even really think that the animal experts would tell you an animal would have no interest in this in that. But a stranger would have no interest in this in that. Items that identify these remains of Bill and Red One were all missing. Larger items that should have been easy to find. Yeah. And Bill and Red with some of the experts talking about a lot of this type, different insights, like the other documents. But not here. They didn't find the scroll, not on this part of the map. Not on this search. After investigators had found Dylan's remains, and they found the blood in the defendant's they sought out the assistance of a specialist, an expert from out of state. Her name, at the time, she was an officer, a police officer, named Karen Corpus. She had handled dogs for decades. She worked with this one police officer that certified dogs for more than one day. She handled cadaver specific dogs multiple times. She trained in herself. She certified the management. She started her own company in NC and trained others and worked on those matches. She was an expert, and you'll hear a testifying truth in court before as a handler. And she was telling me that Molly, who she called Biddy, was one of the best dogs she's ever had. When she brought Biddy out here, Biddy had been certified by a national agency multiple times before coming out. She demonstrated an accuracy rate of in the 90%, above 90%, and even more by the time she came here than some of those earlier errors that came back in 2012. By 2012, the dog had barely ever been. The dog had been a state call positive. The dog that had located over a dozen in the The dog that had been used in a different capacity as well, with someone who was missing on search and rescue, going to a home. The dog who had found the odor of his name years later, a crime scene, a confession to the dog, the location section. A very reliable dog and an expert handler. And if you were in, Kitty had no problem finding the remains site in the first few months of the novel. But what's more significant is when Biddy looked at items in the Starting with the defendant's clothing. Biddy indicated her final, final train response as to the odor of human remains, as to the defendant's shoes, jeans, the outer shirts that were in evidence in the Walmart video, but did not indicate. Did he sniff two different trucks, a Chevy truck and a Dodge truck? Did he only use his one Dodge truck? She knew he was in the back of the pickup truck. And in the home, she indicated the odor of human remains. What you'll hear is that the living room was a large source of human remains, and a former officer, Corcoran, was talking about that in detail. What's noteworthy is that this house right here at the time. Now, Officer Corcoran, on purpose, comes in with minimal facts for any person. She doesn't know where any of the evidence is located. She 
She only knows generally that the missing child and she's in search of father. And she works with God Rock Leash and the dog found in the case of the senior man that the entity. Okay? We have the same area. And then upstairs, the washing machine, and instead, there she was going. In the bed of the pickup truck. Straps and chains that will show you were actually there way back in November as well. We were present and offered support during the first circle a year later. The city was able to indicate that the other The defendant's clothing was a nice bow on him. The back of the Dodge pickup truck, you'll clear it up on Middle Mountain by the time. The defendant's home. All the areas one would expect to find later in the remains of Mark Redline, where the new son was fired. It would be three years to the month of filming this appearance that hikers off trail to an entirely different part of the mountain, Daniel and Lee Foster, would come across the And when they saw it, they knew it was they knew the child died. Then they called him. The investigators went out and it took them a couple more days to actually go through the stall or search because it wasn't there at the spot. And they moved to the place where it was. And we have these contacts. You see the distances related to this. Then, this is 1,500 vertical feet up over deadfall and rocks and trees, an area that was only searched by investigators after the skull was located that revealed not a single other bone or the material or scrap of it. Nothing. Not even animal bones. 1,500 feet up and another 500 feet down into the valley. So if I rode over five and a half miles up, the head of the valley was too fast. That's where the skull, the only skull was kind of The reason that skull was so far from the rest of the remains is the question. You totally took the skull off. The certified forensic anthropology center, one of less than 100 certified uh, certified an expert in the field, someone who interpreted markings on bones, um, someone who now currently has access to the Smithsonian The leading expert in the field, they sent this to us. And Dr. France has looked at the other bones, and all she's noticed is now my dad is that she has a skull, which has removed this. Because when she put it under a microscope, she looked over it, she found injuries. She found fractures consistent with one force on it. Perry Morton, which means that the bone still has the characteristics consistent with living or wet bone, something she'll explain to you in the same out now. But it's the same as living bone. Above the left eye, fracture consistent with the hardest part of the skull. And along the suture, another fracture consistent with one fourth time. That wasn't all that she found when she was getting in the skull. When she put it under a microscope, she found some small cut marks, indicative of a human tooth a piece that one bone so far away from the rest of the room. A human can't bring it back. Crashes. Evidence is that it was really bad for the last 30 years. Okay. In the course of this trial, you're going to hear from over 50 witnesses. Um, the prosecution. Uh, let me correct that. It'll be roughly 50 minutes of the difference. What you're going to hear from investigators, 
If you've got all the searches they did, if you've got all the interviews that they did, we talked about a lot of this already. We talked about how they collected interviews from all film friends and all records and electronics, all coming back to that one. Well, if you're from the friends, go spy us at a party and pick them there. The friends who are with us are looking back. And if you're from the friends that used to be that night, and you'll also hear important things that nobody heard. Not as friends in the area. I'm Ryan Nava. That trip can lead to close to friends about five miles away. None of them I hear from family and friends, the people that knew Dylan back, the people who saw him more than just a few times a year. His mother, Elaine Hall, his brother, Corey Redline, and his stepfather, Mike Hall. And you'll hear from them, you'll hear that he was uninjured, that he's never coming back from that college in the In fact, what we'll show you, Corey Redline will talk about this, but we'll also show you the circumstances of time. But you'll learn that that living room wasn't a childhood living room that was on the ground. The living room that the house had burned down in the city had been rebuilt. The floors were done. The furniture was uh, replaced. And it wasn't until April 22nd, 2011, that that was the actual building that the house had been brought out. And from there, these witnesses will tell you that it was only a piece of paper. There's only a few times that he even been in that house. He was a defendant himself. He rarely in that house. That was a few times. He was a few times that 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 Rarely, if ever, this is a type of thing. My call was looking up on Middle Mountain Road and it was fired to the place while the defendant was beating down that mountainside in the sky. Um, Amber Harrison will explain to you that Dylan Redwine had actually seen this photograph, which they discussed, and that they had set him in the name of the photograph of the law. The 15 year old girl. You'll hear from Kathy Berry, she was a friend uh, of Wayne Redline, who went over to look at him in the past, and they had yelled at the defendant. And that's when the defendant grabbed the law and threatened her after she called the machine. It wasn't the time that she saw the defendant. And then you'll hear from experts. I've talked about several of these already. Here from Joe Clayton, who's processed a thousand crime scenes. He'll tell you it looks like this crime scene. So I'll let him talk about that. But what is intuitive is just the blood is no longer this bolt of the day to die. Here from serology and DNA, I posted about the technology in 2013, I'm sorry, and then following up with the biggest star mix technology. Yeah. You'll hear from wildlife experts, Heather Johnson, who has a PhD in wildlife biology, happens to be working and studying the area at the time of the college paper. We'll just go through this to explain it. So, there is a high risk of that. So, that's all aware that she was lost in college law. She's a low food year, especially up on the college. That doesn't even exist. Even if you're a type of We'll call Drayton Harrison, who's the regional wildlife manager. He's a man in Phil Tech, part of his work. Say whether or not a certain animal is on it. So you can get the flannel and get the drag and carpet up or down. It's uncommon to go beyond the building miles of searching for the train and that and that. So we'll adjust the three scenarios whether an animal could have killed Dylan around that time, whether an animal would have dragged him up a mile and a half. Within 100 yards of the road. Whether any animal is normal animal to get you, just pick up a skull, literally, and just carry it over a mile and a half. Or 
going to call three of those three. None of that is typical. And then certified anthropologist and certified pathologist. We talked about the Diane France a little bit. She will explain to you the other interesting thing about Diane France. She works for the Hong Kong Network. She insists in the location of people who are missing, so there's a foul play that isn't supposed to work out well. She works with that. She talked to me a little bit about why it's probably common sense to say that this is a traditional type of stuff that's so bad. It's not easy to go down to the most familiarity with that. <coughs> And certified pathologist, Dr. Kurt, who's done autopsies for years and years, he's a medical doctor, he works at the coroner's office here as a police pathologist in the autopsy to determine cause and manner of death. Bring him in from a separate system to tell you consistently what Diane Trans, Dr. Trans has already said. Those are cut marks that go in here with physical cultural trauma, and it is assessed in the evidence in each area. Led him to conclude manner of death can take a homicide. As you hear from all of these witnesses, there's a 50 of them, pay close attention. Because some of the evidence that you're going to find is so concerned with people, some of the evidence that lies in the details, some of the misdirection that the defendant employed to keep the focus off of. Some of the statements he made that later revealed they were just two things and that was a one thing. The pillow case. A pillow case is search and rescue asking to use. A pillow case that led to no trail to go. A pillow case that is supposedly laying where no one is left. In the search and rescue, we got curious about to set up an experiment with this going dog. We can share that pillow case up and down on the floor. Fishing sport. Six foot fishing pole, a quarter red wine, and the defendant knew it was kept in the garage. A fishing pole that launched searches in specific areas away from Middle Mountain Road throughout the investigation. A fishing pole that was not found in the search warrant by FBI at the time, and that wasn't found by investigator counseling that it was in the garage, wasn't found by the defendant at the time. It was only produced in July of 2000. After Dylan's remains had been found at Hill Mountain, no more reason to extract the water. The debit card. The debit card that Dylan Redwine is known to have on his person when he's been on his trip. For a joint account with his father, he was unable to ask something his father didn't mention to Ron for two point in time. Not in any of the details of what they talked about or done that. Debit card that I didn't have Dylan was not. The debit card that when the defendant said Dylan had left any of his items behind, it was more than a small amount of the case that was saying. The debit card that in 2014 Mark, when the defendant died from the third, found in the debit card that the defendant was bringing the account from the start of the meeting as he saw that the student store said in January 2013. And the defendant's statement. You'll hear about how when he showed the remains of his son, he called Dylan's half of the branded red line as much as it was. He was with him for that time. He mentioned the term one fourth comma, the branded red line, so many times that he was alarmed when he contacted the police. And he called his father back and reported the reference. Because at the time, it's all not been found in the best case of having talked about the one first time. But that's that said, it's like the time the alarm is still going. And up here, two days later after the remains were shown to him, he cut the city town looking for a ride. And he showed another remains that, that had been found in Florida. But they continued up all the way to the top, all the way to the end of the top of as they came back, we're in view of the valley, it looks down over to the Chokiris uh, from the park. Then I made the comment, is any part of the film found up here? It meant nothing to them at the time, no part of the film was found up there, and some theaters counting it 
gentlemen uh, we're going to take a 15 minute break we'll start up again just about two or three minutes after four o'clock remember my admonitions you're not to talk you won't you won't probably won't see anybody else but you can't talk to yourselves about the case so everybody rise for the jury please Council in their chairs at four o'clock. 